Good morning. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. McKenzie and Dr. Krishna for the invitation to speak today. I have no disclosures. Pergatanius Evar works today. The use of closure devices has gained wide popularity since its introduction back in the 1990s. And as more physicians have gained expertise and experience with percutaneous closure devices, they've widened the usage of it into large bore catheters as well. Increasing use in large bore arterial puncture sites has been utilized in EVARs, TVARs, TAVI, and TAVR procedures. We reported success rates that have been very high from anywhere between 86 to some of these studies reporting 100% technical success rates. And the FDA has approved uh, the usage of percutaneous devices for large sheath access in up to 21 French. There are two currently FDA-approved devices that are used in the United States, the Abbott ProGlide as well as the ProStar XL. At our institution, we use, utilize the ProGlide device for our uh, procedures. And just to briefly go over the pre-close technique, uh, we gain percutaneous access to the femoral artery using a micropuncture with ultrasound guidance. The location is confirmed with an angiogram so that it's above the femoral bifurcation. The Puncture site at the anterior portion of the artery at 12 o'clock is critical. The usage of the percutaneous devices requires it to be at the 12 o'clock position for it to properly deploy its suture. I like to dilate the track up with the seven French sheets so that all, all the, uh, the um, sutures get tracked down into the vessel without any kind of kinking. And then the first proglide is advanced over the 035 wire. The guide wire is removed. The devices advance until there's percentile bleeding from the side port. It's rotated 30 degrees medially. The foot plate is set and deploy, the, the suture is deployed. This is repeated for a second proglide device in the 30 degree uh, lateral orientation. And this is kind of what's happening on the inside of the vessel. The proglide device is advanced into the artery. The foot plate is set. And in anterior to posterior fashion, the suture is, divided, is delivered in the location so that when it's cinched up at the end, the walls are brought together. And the pretty close technique, this is the orientation that you're looking at. One deployed at the 10 o'clock position, the other one uh, at the 2 o'clock position, so that when these sutures are pulled up and cinched down, you can go ahead and lock these sutures uh, and the artery is closed. It's pivotal to tag your sutures with different whatever device that you like to use um, and make sure that the cinching wire is not on any kind of tension so that you don't lock its location in its place. Uh, now with increasing use, we've also utilized uh, Romels that can allow for uh, tightening the actual suture without locking around, the, around large bore sheets. And the benefit is clear. Rather than bilateral common femoral cutdowns, which you can potentially lead to wound complications and seroma development, you can essentially send patients home with almost two band-aids over the groin sites, which they're always kind of very fond of. But however, despite a lot of reports reporting 100% technical success rates, we've all had failures, and percutaneous EVAR is not for everyone. Uh, there are a group of patients if with poor patient selection that can lead to either pseudoaneurysm and hematoban development. And in patients who particularly have posterior plaques that are not very well identified or uh, close attention is not paid attention to, the proglide can actually catch the posterior plaque and bring up and, and shut down the entire artery leading to lower extremity ischemia. Failure of percutaneous closure often will require a surgical cutdown. However, if it does happen in the operating room, the most important key take home point is to not lose wire access. If there's bleeding around a failed percutaneous site, it can be temporized by re advancing the sheath, and a surgical cutdown can be done in a more controlled fashion. Additional proglides can be deployed if appropriate. If one of the two proglides had taken, uh, then you can potentially de deploy additional proglides as well. Um, Dr. Schimmerhorn's group in, from Boston looked at what are the predictive factors of uh, failure in percutaneous EVARs, and they recognized that small access is probably the number one. And you can see in this graph in their review of around 300 patients retrospectively, patients who had vessel sizes less than six millimeters, the percent of failure started rising precipitously. They even attempted a percutaneous uh, case in a patient with 3.9 millimeter vessel, which should be commended, but unfortunately didn't seem to work. Uh, calcium is really the major enemy to percutaneous EVAR uh, cases. You're relying on the artery to be complying enough for it to come together when you cinch up on the actual suture at the end of the case. However, calcium will preclude you from doing that. Posterior wall calcium, it needs to be identified and you have to make sure that you don't catch it with the initial entry device, but you can still deploy uh, the percutaneous device in probably these two arteries. But if the artery looks like this the entire way through, that's a real cautionary tale to avoid that artery as your sutures will not be able to bring that artery together at the end. 
other kind of relative things to think about, recent femoral access and intervention where the artery may be injured, you're relying on the artery to be healthy enough to tolerate these sutures, so this should be taken on a case-by-case -case basis. If you see a pri prior groin incision, it's important to review what that patient had. Is it a bypass conventional EVAR? But in particular, uh, patches with uh, Dacron are sometimes very difficult to puncture and dilate up using any kind of sheath that you have, so caution should be taken. Obese patients are kind of a very tempting patient population to uh, do a percutaneous EVAR on because we know that patients who have uh, Obese groins are at higher risk of developing wound infections, seroma development. And recently, uh, the group out of Yale looked at the NISCLIP database from 2005 to 2013 and compared morbidly obese patients, BMIs greater than 40, undergoing conventional EVAR versus percutaneous EVAR. Interestingly, over the past decade, uh, there's been increasing, uh, with increasing physician comfort level and expertise, more physicians are attempting to do EVARs in morbidly obese patients. And overall, they found that in patients with BMIs greater than 40, they, that percutaneous EVAR does have a uh, benefit in terms of wound complication rates, 9.4 versus 5.5, uh, and also decreased the total operative OR time. But when they subdivided that into super obese patients, VMIs greater than 50, that all that p-value seems to become non-significant, though their numbers are small in this kind of cohort, and the wound complication rate they only report is 3.4% in the super obese patients, so this should be taken with a grain of salt. So percutaneous EVAR does work, but it's not for every patient. Patient selection is key to good outcomes, and the two major take-home points would be avoid anterior calcifi calcification and avoid small vessels to make sure that you're successful in your procedure. Thank you very much.